Hey guys, welcome to The Remnant Radio. You're watching one of 19 episodes with Dr. Craig Keener, one of the preeminent Bible scholars on the planet, and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. This is going to be an exciting episode. The connections that Dr. Keener put together while we were with him at Asbury Seminary, phenomenal. But man, it was an expensive trip to get all of us out there to film this content. But we want to give it to you for free. Well, we do want to give it to you for free, but... One of the ways that you can help offset the cost for this is by purchasing our home group material. Dawson, our researcher, has put together this material. There's a leader's guide. There is a participant's guide. So you you watch the video, you read the material, and then we walk you through. We have discussion questions that go along with it. It could be a huge blessing for you and your church. Yeah, and this would be perfect for tons of different mediums. Maybe you're a pastor uh, who's preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a home group leader, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, this would fit all of your needs. And if you want to pick this up, there's a link in the description for the home group material. In addition to that, maybe you're out there and you don't lead any kind of group like that. Uh, maybe you just want to contribute as a thank you to what we've put together here on Remnant. There's PayPal descriptions in the link of this video if you would like to uh, support us. So absolutely, click those links in the description, hit that subscribe button, and please enjoy this video with Dr. Craig here. What do we have to look forward to here in chapter 14? Yeah, it is It is 72 verses, so it's yeah. like twice the length of some, some chapters. But Jesus has just um, had conflicts with the temple authorities in chapter 12. Uh, he's pronounced judgment on the temple in chapter 13. And starting in chapter 14, well, some have already been plotting to kill him, but at this point it gets really serious. They say they're going to have to kill him. And that beginning the plot and then Judas betraying him to those authorities frames in between an anointing for his burial. And uh, that also is going to frame the passion narrative because there's a woman who, frame, who anoints him for his burial, and then in chapter 16 you have some who come to anoint him at his burial, and they're too late. So it's good she did it in advance, mm. uh, not, not probably not knowing that, mm. that she was doing it in advance. And then you have uh, Jesus pouring out his heart before the Father, knowing what's what's awaiting him it seems like you know he's been announcing it but at this point he's like right on the edge of it and he's actually geographically where he is in the mount of olives he could have fled across to the other side of the mountain and they would have never found him but well we we know he he doesn't do that and he's there when he gets arrested and he's brought for trial and they're looking for grounds to condemn him, and they can't find anything else that'll work. So they get him to say something that they consider, this is, this is grounds for condemning him, where he just tells them the truth of his identity that they don't believe. But we've known since verse 1 of chapter 1. And Peter, who said, I'll follow you to the end, abandons Jesus who keeps experiencing abandonment of everybody who said they'd follow him, Peter being almost the last, until finally on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, 1534, why have you abandoned me? So start in for us on Mark 14, 1 through 2. How does that fit into that Mark's gospel? Well, they 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 uh, plot to kill him not not at the Passover and I think what they mean by that is not uh, not at the festival not well the crowds are gathered he's too popular so they decide to take him at night which is uh, what we're going to see later in the narrative and that um, that frames the anointing at at Bethany because right after that Judas is going to betray him to to these authorities and they and Judas are kind of the opposite of this woman who anoints him. They're, they're out to kill him, and she's out to lavish all her, her love on him. Hmm. The Simon, who's currently a leper, or someone else that Jesus healed? 14.3, uh, I think it is, where it mentions Simon the leper. If they're all together in the same house, unless they're totally blowing off purity regulations, this is, you know, he, he has the nickname the leper, but he's not a leper anymore. Jesus right. healed him. Okay, so Simon, the former leper. So, like, we identify people with, with the woman with the issue of blood, but, like, she's actually probably more known for the woman who was formerly known with the issue of blood. 
Yeah. <laughs> the artist formerly known. That's right. Yeah. So the the anointing that's taking place, is this a messianic anointing? That's a big debate among scholars because it doesn't use, it, it's not olive oil, but it's something more precious than olive oil. So it's not going to be, it's not less than olive oil. So that doesn't take away from it. But normally people were anointed by, you know, very prominent people, you know, a prophet or uh, a prophet could anoint a king or you could have a priest anoint a king. She's not that kind of high status person in the society. You know, in the East, women actually often weren't allowed to be at men's banquets unless they were servers or dancers or <laughs> something, you know, something else like that. But she comes in and she anoints him. And yet from what we see in the rest of the gospel, maybe, okay, she's not, she's not a prophet. She's not a priest. But she's the kind of person that would actually be more respected there. But they also point out it doesn't use the, the word, um, the, the, the uh, verb uh, creo that's related to Christos. So people will often say it's not a messianic anointing. My guess is she just is anointing him the way a host would anoint a guest or offer anointing to a guest, except she's lavishing all this on him. I mean, the, the whole vial of, of ointment or perfume. So and it's very expensive. It's like 300 denarii worth, um, which is that would have fed the maybe the 5,000 earlier when they <laughs> thought of how many denarii they needed to, to feed them. So it's, it's a massive expense. And she she lavishes it all on him. So it's it's very sacrificial. Jesus treats it as an anointing for his burial. But there may be a sense in which it also signifies his messianic anointing, because ultimately his act of kingship is going to be expressed when he's crowned with thorns and labeled as king of the Jews. At the same time, effectively, he was anointed by the Spirit back in Mark chapter 1 and verse mm -hmm. 10. You know, um, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, well, and has anointed me for this mission. Jesus has been anointed as Messiah for a long time. Hmm. So, so why is the story so significant? I mean, this story is going to be told all over the world, right? But Jesus is being anointed by a sinner, not by, or, well, or well, I well, guess okay, someone you're who... You're mixing with Luke 7. Yeah, there you uh, go. 36 to 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's, he's being anointed by this woman, not, not by some great priest, some great prophet. So why is it so significant? Why is this story going to be told throughout the world? maybe precisely because of her humility. Remember, the, the least is the greatest. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it is the anointing for his burial, because uh, in chapter 16, when the women come to anoint him, it's going to be too late. So he's being anointed beforehand for his mm -hmm. burial. She may not see it that way. She just sees it as a devoted sacrifice. But she's gone way beyond what the male disciples have done. And we're going to see the women disciples come in again in 1540 and 41, where they actually follow, they're, they're at the cross and they follow to the tomb. And that goes way beyond the male disciples. Now, <laughs> given the, given usual practices of punishing transgressors and so on, they wouldn't be viewed as a threat by the establishment the same way the, the men did. So they they probably had less to lose in a sense. But in terms of Mark's narrative, I mean, they're, they're doing better than the men. And we'll find out in chapter 16 just how well they do or if it's good enough. This whole scene uh, plays like a movie. You clip from, you know, from here to there, like the woman of the anointing, and now you go straight over to Judas approaching the leaders of Israel. Build, build suspense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's happening here? He now, he now has gone over to betray the Lord. Tell us about this time. Yeah, that's you've got a mark and sandwich in between. Um, in in Matthew, you have uh, the woman lavishing all this on Jesus, and you have um, the disciples complaining and and saying, "Why this waste? This could have been given to the poor, 
And of course, Jesus is concerned about the poor. You see that elsewhere, mm -hmm. 1021 and uh, the end of chapter 12 and, and so on. But, um, but this is a once for all, what, what Jesus is going to do for humanity. And this is her way of showing him the love that all of us should have shown him, but she was the only one to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, she's, she, that's really special what she did. And then you have Judas who betrays him. And so in my Matthew commentary, I, I worded it this way, that whole section, how much is Jesus worth? She thought he was worth everything. The disciples thought he was worth something. Judas thought he was worth 30 pieces of silver. Now, Mark doesn't wow. break it out quite that way, but you see the contrast between her and yeah. those who raised the, the objection and then, and then Judas, yeah. Now, who was this who was anointing Jesus? Specifically, it was St. Mary, right? Like the, the, we have these different stories from the other Gospels that kind of speak into this. Yeah, in, in John chapter 12, clearly it's Mary, the sister of, of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe Simon was their dad or, or something like that. <clears throat> but uh, Mark doesn't specify her name. Mark leaves her anonymous. He leaves the disciple who leaves his cloak behind anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people think it's because when the passion narrative was first being circulated, it was first circulated in the Jerusalem church which is where the church was centered. I mean, the, the disciples eventually settled there after their, their meeting with them in Galilee. And we know that from Paul's letters and elsewhere. So, so it was important that they remain anonymous. It was important they remain anonymous because these people could still be arrested, especially the one who cuts off. Wow. Oh, wow. So this is, this is modern Facebook screening. Like, please don't take a photo of me while we're in the Middle East. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Like my friends in Southeast Asia, right? Because you can't say where I am. Yeah, at. I mean, this is going to circulate. So, of course, if they know the name of these people, wait, this person did what? This is testimony and witness against them. Yeah, and Mary of Bethany. I mean, she lives just just outside of town. So yeah. it's, it's wiser to keep keep things anonymous at hmm. this point. Now, there is there, there are some differences with John. And, you know, Matthew follows Mark fairly closely, but you have the anointing that you alluded to earlier in Luke chapter 7. Mm -hmm. um, that's a different person, but you know, you have the copycat touching his robe. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, she may have gotten the idea from this other person. And I think John may mix, mix and match some of those because he's only going to tell the story once. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, if you're going to anoint the head and the person's reclining, you know, you got some leftover, you may as well anoint the feet too. But but John is going to draw a point because she she anoints Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. And the next chapter, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Mm -hmm. So he's following her example, in a sense, mm -hmm. of, of servanthood and then exhorting all the disciples to do the same thing. But um, Mark, it's the anointing of the head, uh, so it has the more royal, mm -hmm. po possibly, like we mentioned, uh, connotations to it. Interesting. So... Uh, Although Jesus, people often anointed the head too, so anyway, I, yeah. I think I think there's the royal connotation, but I understand why scholars disagree on this. Yeah. Um, so the next thing he begins to make plans for the Passover meal, and he tells the disciples to go and do all these things. Is he doing this through foreknowledge? Uh, is this divine? Is this pre-planned? Some. Yeah, scholars divide on this, and it's usually the same division of scholars who divide on when Jesus sends a couple of his disciples to go get the, the colt, uh, you know, from Bethany to Bethphaga. Scholars divide on it, but what I see in Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't pre-plan a whole lot. He, he depends on his Father to provide for him, and I think here we have foreknowledge. I mean, he, he predicts his betrayer in this context. Why couldn't he predict you're going to meet this person who's carrying a pitcher of water? Some people say, well, men didn't carry pitchers of water. That was women. Well, often it was, but you also had servants who could be male or female. And sure. they would, so I don't think it's just that, but they're going to meet a certain, a certain uh, man who's carrying a pitcher of water. And, you know, when they meet him, they follow him and everything's going to be prepared because people were expecting Passover pilgrims. Mm. Well, this is a this is a, a host who maybe has heard of Jesus, the teacher, and uh, or or just you know hears that it's a teacher, and it's like, oh yeah, I want that guest to come and his disciples. So well, that would be an honor to have have them. So I think it's it's foreknowledge. I think it was also with the 
about the donkey in chapter 11. Mm, that's, that's interesting. So I, I love the story of Passover and how, how does the Last Supper fit into the Passover narrative? Mm-hmm. I know that we could literally do an hour-long show on that alone mm-hmm. because, again, if you've done a Messianic Passover, there's a lot of object lessons in there. But can you, can you speak to that for us briefly? Some of, the, some of the customs of today's Passover Seder may not have existed yet in Jesus' day, but we do have confidence of enough of them to see enough, mm-hmm. enough parallels yeah. uh, in, in what Jesus does. And Jeremias argued that. Uh, pretty thoroughly, a, a Lutheran scholar a generation ago. And Brant Petrie, a Catholic scholar, has really gone to town, has done a great job. Joel Marcus at Duke did a, did a good article on this too, but thinking in terms of books, Brant Petrie, uh, Jesus and the Last Supper, is really good in this. I'm, I'm being inconsistent because sometimes I'm citing scholars and sometimes I'm not. But anyway, um, but just to say this, is, this has been well-researched and some of the customs were banquet customs throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, but uh, reclining that was that was common at uh, at banquets. Jewish people didn't recline all the time, but for banquets they would follow the Greek symposium custom of of reclining. You'd recline on your left elbow. You'd reach out with your your right hand. Um, to the food that was already cut up in front of you because you'd need both hands otherwise. Uh, Also, your cup would be there. Uh, They used red wine for Passover, so it it would work for, you know, symbolizing blood more more simply, you know, from from red grapes or dark grapes. And because they they would recline on on the elbow, normally, if they could afford it, they'd be reclining on couches. Probably most people couldn't afford it, so they might be reclining on uh, blankets or, or outer garments or something like that, but normally on a, on a, in a position of a triclinium, which Jewish people also had. That was a Roman practice, but you have it in some Jewish homes as well. Um, but also just the reclining custom, you would, you would have like uh, three places, three couches, and you could recline three or four people per couch. And the way they would be seated or reclining, I, I can't, uh, it'd make you have to change all your camera settings if I tried to illustrate it for you, but uh, re- reclining here, you have your hand here, but you're facing the table and your feet are pointing away from it. So the person next to you, their feet are also pointing to the back. And this person's ranged a little bit farther back so that technically the person to the right could lean back his head on the chest of the person uh, to to his left. Mm-hmm. That's why the beloved disciple, you know, he's to the right of Jesus in John 13, 23, um, which also echoes uh, Jesus being in the bosom of the Father, I stand kolpan. But in John, John 13, 23, he can, you know, the beloved disciple can do that. And for Jesus to be able to reach out and give the... Um, the morsel to, to Judas means Judas is probably on the other side of him. Um, but also among the, the Passover customs, there would be certain questions that would be asked. Uh, it, was, it was a memorial, as Exodus 12 puts it. Uh, every, every year annually you would do this as a memorial of what God did for you uh, in, in bringing you out of the land of Egypt. And so it's not surprising that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul mentions that Jesus says, do this in memory of me. Now, there's a big debate in church history about what that means exactly. Um, Zwingli has the memorial view. Calvin believed it was uh, real presence by the Spirit. And Luther with consubstantiation is a bit closer to the um, medieval Catholic view of transubstantiation. So I won't get into all of that, but it it is a a celebration. It is a memorial. But when Jewish people took the Passover, it wasn't just, oh yeah, I remember that. It was entering into the experience of their ancestors. So at the Passover Seder, they wouldn't just say, our ancestors did this. But they would say, it wasn't just our ancestors, but we. It, this, the Lord did this for us. That's good. And so you're, you're entering into the experience again. Um, 
I mean, we experience the Lord's presence. He's always with us in Christ. But I think we experience that in a special way. We remember that or enter into that experience in a special way that Jesus invited us to in an active, concrete, illustration way. Uh, in in the in, and, and probably should get back to the Passover. But uh, them preparing the Passover, the lamb would be slaughtered in the the lambs would be slaughtered in the temple. There's some debate based on the fourth gospel and the synoptics as to which day it was. I won't get into that. That would be a long digression. But yeah. Anyway, I agree with Brent Petrie, though. And he also agrees with me because I already wrote it in my John commentary. So when you say they're participating with, they're, they're participating in that experience, that would be similar to us when we worship and how we come together and we're, we're carrying on and participating with saints who've come before and after. Same thing yeah. with the passing down of the doctrines. I mean, all of that sort of yeah. uh, participatory way yeah. of, of participating in our faith with people yeah. gone by. Uh, I wouldn't say we invoke the saints who've come before. No, no. But, <laughs> no, <we're, laughs> but we, we're share, we share in the common faith. Yeah. Yes. Amen. So then he, he says, uh, this is the new covenant in mm -hmm. my blood. Mm -hmm. Explain that. What does he mean by that? That's, you know, in a Passover context, there's this idea of redemption. So you think of the Passover lamb. But... A new covenant in my blood actually goes a little bit. Um, that that alludes to Exodus 24, where um, Moses makes a sacrifice and then uh, kind of spatters the blood at the on the people and says, uh, "This is the blood of the covenant." Well, Jeremiah prophesied a new covenant uh, in which. God's law would be written in our hearts. And of course, Ezekiel 36 talks about the, the laws being written in our hearts as well and so on. Uh, so this is, and Matthew makes it more explicit and Paul makes it more explicit. This is, this is a new covenant and people would understand that this isn't the same one, uh, but this is a new act of redemption and this is inaugurating that new covenant. Now, people sometimes ask whether the, and we, sort of touched on this when we mentioned the different views, but is this literal body? Is this literal blood? And part of this may depend on how literally you mean literal, but I don't know anybody who would call it cannibalism, but in the second century, that's what Christians were accused of. That's right. Because mm -hmm. outsiders said, you know, they, they talk about eating the body and, and drinking the blood of their Lord, this is cannibalism, just like they accused Christians of incest. I love you, brother. I love you, sister. Um, outsiders of any group can always uh, Exaggerate. Mm -hmm. find ways to make the group look bad. So uh, you have it with the Jewish people with the blood libel and so on. So uh, I, I, yeah, without, without specifying exactly which view I exactly take, um, Luther Luther broke fellowship with Zwingli over this. this yep. That was me. I mean, he unfriended him on Facebook. I, yeah, that's talk right. About that. <laughs> that's right. So, but he wrote, he, he wrote it into the table with a knife. This is, yeah. or was it shock? I forget. Each, each way the story gets told, it's a little bit different. Yeah. This is my body. But I mean, Jesus is saying this in the Passover context. Yeah. At the at the Passover. Of course, there would be the blessing of the bread and the wine like there was at every meal, but also there's this interpretation. And with the, with the bread, the interpretation is, this is the bread that our ancestors ate when they came out of the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, was it literally the same bread chemically that their ancestors ate when they came out of the land of Egypt? Because if it was, it was like 1,300 years stale, yeah. depending on when you date the Exodus. and it had already been eaten and digested. I mean, that's just gross. Right. <laughs> but so I don't think we would say it's literal. I don't think Jesus' disciples took him literally that this is cannibalism. They wouldn't say this, is, this chemically becomes the body and blood of Jesus. But experientially, by the Spirit, I guess I am giving away sort of my, you know, we, we enter into that experience. I don't think we would disagree with you. And, and if you want to learn more about those four views, there's an episode with Matthew Esquivel where he articulates the four views within mm -hmm. Protestant history and in contrast to the Roman Catholic period. So it would be helpful for you guys to listen to if you wanted to. There's a, there's a statement R he makes. Roman Catholic period, that, now that sounds like 
they're stopping Roman Catholics after. Oh, uh, I meant I meant the Protestant Reformation. Prior period. to the Reformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 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 Protestant period, I should say. Okay. Um, yeah, um, with uh, with the, this discussion of communion, and there's a statement that Jesus makes: "I'm not going to drink of this cup." Until the until the kingdom, and I'm I'm paraphrasing here. It's for, verse twenty six. I think. What does no, that the mean? Verse twenty. It's verse twenty five. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. What what does that mean? How do we? How are we to understand that Jesus isn't going to drink this cup with us until the kingdom? Well, you notice on the cross, he refuses the the drink that's offered to him. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, but also he's he's talking about the drinking in the kingdom, the idea of the messianic banquet. You have it in Isaiah 26, mm. or 25 or 26, <laughs> on the Isaiah ones. I'm like, uh, one of these chapters. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't know Isaiah as well as I know the New Testament. Uh, and I'm You've done great camera. so far. I think you're okay. <laughs> Some, somewhere in that ballpark. <laughs> um, but G- Jesus is talking about that. Uh, Jewish tradition also talked about this, this coming Messianic banquet, uh, this um, era of celebration when, you know, uh, Amos talked about the hills flowing with with new wine and, and so on. So there's coming a time, and I think that's also why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, maybe this is where I was thinking, verse 26, um, by, by doing this, we celebrate the Lord's death until he comes. Mm-hmm. So it looks back on what he's done, and it looks forward to his coming when, when we'll celebrate the full effects of what he's done for us. So right after this, they finish it with a hymn. Mm-hmm. Is this a well-known hymn? Is this a traditional hymn, or is this something new? It's Amazing Grace. In <laughs> Psalms Amen. 113 through 118 yeah. was the Hallel that would be sung during Passover season and other festivals. And they, they finished the first part of it, 113 through 115, uh, before this point. So after the supper, they would, they would sing the rest of the Hallel. So they're going to be hearing again. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And they're also going to be hearing, blessed is the one who comes in the name Mm. of the Lord. I hope you've enjoyed that episode on the Gospel of Mark with Dr. Craig Keener. If you want to go back and watch former episodes that we've done, there's a playlist right here. uh, Or you can watch the very next chapter, which will be listed right here. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, consider giving. There are links in the description. 